Go. All right. So this is our idle chit chat portion of the show. <laughs> so trigger, lay us. No, don't lay any brilliance on us. We'll save that. Let's just start the show, shall we? Here we go with a little Mac DeMarco. <laughs> And thanks for joining the uh, Des Moines Tiger Radio Show this evening. We have one heck of a show tonight. We have a whole ton of stuff to cover. So uh, we were just talking before the show started that I think we could do a number of shows <laughs> without uh, much problem at all. But uh, anyway, so we'll do our best. And if we wind up breaking this into two pieces, we'll do so. But uh, we'll, we'll just see how it goes because... Uh, as, as most uh, people who have listened to the show previously, our uh, conversation is rather organic, and we don't always know what we're going to be, uh, which direction we're going to go on any one section. So, anyway, um, I want everyone to know that uh, for me again, it's another special show. I have Tim with me. Please say hello, Tim. <laughs> and and get this, Tim. We have Trigger with us. So Trigger. I mean, just limit it to hello. No. Hi, guys. <laughs> thanks, thanks you guys, for joining me. It, it's going to be great. I know, and I always have fun chatting with you guys, so this will be awesome. Um, <laughs> which reminds me, what was that Chris Farley skit where, you know, he asks questions as, like, some big celebrity, and he goes, yeah, that was awesome. I mean, he doesn't add anything. Oh, you All guys right. are too young. You don't know that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was so hilarious. That's, a, that's awesome. And that, that's all he said. You remember that time when you did that? And then you go, yeah, that was awesome. Anyway. All right. Sidetracked already. Um, tonight, we're going to attempt to take you on a tour of what libertarian is, libertarianism is. You know, we're going to try to define it, explain it as best we can in a in the short confines that we have here tonight. Um, it's a little, I would say, like uh, trying to explain theoretical physics in an hour. It, you know, it is really, there's, it's all encompassing essentially. So uh, when people claim, hey, you had a hole there, you didn't fully explain something. I mean, we, likely we know. <laughs> We're trying to move along and keep it going and we'll do follow-up shows on, um, you know, more detailed sections of what we're about to talk about. Um, before we get to the announcements that Trigger's going to do for us tonight, I just want to, I had a little brief explanation of the use of words. You know, we, we try to define them for our discussion because, you know, words have meaning. We're attempting to be precise on the show, so we're trying to be careful with our words. And so don't hesitate to ask questions or call us out in the event you believe that we are imprecise or have made some errors. We, we uh, love... Um, critiques so that we can improve um, and by the way this is essentially a discussion show uh, and we encourage all who wish to do so to join us uh, do so respectfully and uh, the chat room is open but I stole that thunder from Trigger there he's going to explain that one yeah yeah uh oh uh oh, doggone it! Not again! All right, I'm over here. This is how we do this here. Um, all I can do is I check the preferences section in uh, in the Skype connection. Sometimes I did. Go ahead, say something, Tim. <laughs> doggone it! Uh, let's see. If this does anything, yeah, go ahead. Try now testing. No, I lost. 
um, built-in output. Doggone it. All right, let me try one other thing, Tim. Um, see, I don't, oh, I didn't change a thing from last week. So this is the stuff that just freaks me out, you know, that how is it different? Um, it should be going output to the headphones. All right. Let's see. All right, try something now, Tim. Yeah, I got nothing on Tim right now. Nope. I don't see it. Hang on. Yeah, and I don't see you in the, uh, let's see, internal microphone. Let's see. One time I just messed with this volume a little bit, and it came. Oh, this is so aggravating. How can that be? Um, I don't even have that many options. Let's see. All right, try something now, Tim. No. Yeah, I see. All right, try it now. No. No, they're not. I can see you're not showing up in the um, console, on the DJ console. Shoot. Okay, that sounds good. I'm sorry, Tim. All right. Sorry, so it's just going to be the... Yep. <laughs> uh, it's going to be the... All right, it's going to be the Tom and Trigger show, I guess, tonight. Oh, that's just... TNT. Yeah, TNT. Um, that's a shame. Tim is extremely knowledgeable. He, he adds a whole lot of insight, so uh, we're going to certainly miss that, to be sure. Um, I can hear you, Tim, so if you want to stay on, and when you add something and you listen to me, and uh, you know, I, if you want to add something, that would be great. I can uh, relay it onto the show. Okay, All cool. Right, Tom, but when you do it, I want you to do it in a different voice. Yes, yeah, exactly. So people can tell it's not actually, they're not my words. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, we apologize for that. We have those technical difficulties once in a while, but that's a, a whole nother long story. Once that, in a while. Yeah, once in a while. Okay. Um, anyway, a uh, uh, word about the use of the words or terms, you know, I tend to stay away a little bit from the words uh, libertarian, libertarianism, anarchy, anarcho-capitalist, anarchism, blah, 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 those words, just because they kind of freak people out. Um, but on the show tonight, I'm actually going to use them partially interchangeably a little bit. There'll be some explanation uh, with the free, with freedom or the freedom philosophy or liberty just because I'll get tired of saying the same word over and over and over on this show, on this episode tonight. So just be forewarned, there's actually some subtle differences, and I don't know if I'll get to that tonight. We might do this a little shorter and cut this into two shows so we get our technology figured out and get Tim added back. Um, but with that, so terms, think about that a little bit. Let's let Justin do the uh, announcements for announcements? you. Announcements? Yeah, do them fast, because we got stuff to do. How fast? Really fast. Just all right. The announcements for tonight are Agorafest 2015 at the Villa Marie Conference Center and Retreat, September 24th to 27th. More details to come. Save the date. And more details. Hey, uh, Nicholas Ludwig. Oh, yes. Who's been on the show before? Yes. And you're gonna get back on again. Yes, and he'll explain all about Agorafest coming up. Perfect. And then have you watch Justice? What's the right thing to do? Episode six. Mind your motive. From Harvard Business School, Michael Sandel. Yes, that's a good video. Sir. It's a, We post them on Facebook, and they're right. excellent. Well, we'll post them again. Yes. I watched the first one. It was pretty good. Okay, cool. Watch Citizen Borer. The link is on the Facebook page. And if people don't know what Citizen Four is, what is it, Trigger? Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden. Documentary. Yes. Documentary. And uh, Glenn Greenwald is Glenn the... Glenn Greenwald and the, the lady. I don't remember her name, um, but but awesome show. Yeah, not full of action. You got to be in the mood where you just want to sit there and really absorb this. Have your mind blown at what yeah. really goes on. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And Tom has a 
thing that says, Read Conscience of an Anarchist by Gary Chartier. Very good. <laughs> Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. 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 Full text available online at for free at fee.org. Yep. Likely our next show will be on Thursday evening, March the 26th at 7 p.m. Central. This will be our education show with the Northwoods mom, who's very funny. Yes. And very intuitive. Yes. Should be very enlightening. I may do a short show on our regularly scheduled day as well. Because uh, Tom's deciding to drive across country. Yeah. <laughs> And then the following show will be at our regular time and day, and the topic will be the concept of self-ownership. should be very, very thought-provoking. All right. The chat room is open. I have to say that one. Okay. I was told to. Okay. That's very good. Thank you. Um, I think there, there's a lot in those announcements. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of good resources or references available for people on that Facebook page. I encourage you to check it out. Um, one of the things I didn't formally write in here, but this requires context, um, this topic, I should say. When people think they're aware of, uh, you know, they, they hear some p certain positions that, again, I'm using that word, libertarians say, and they disagree with them, they tend to discount them. Well, if they don't know what the foundation and the support for that case or that argument is, I think they're at a severe disadvantage. So you're making a decision that, you think this this position is wacky based on the fact that you don't understand the foundation. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to bring some of that foundation to to all of us uh, and hopefully share that in a, in a very uh, comprehensive way. So <clears throat> our, I'm going to forego the news. I usually, we do a little news. We do some commentary. We do some stuff like that. But I'm going to forego that because we have a giant topic tonight. It's going to take us a little bit to get through this. And I don't want to rush through it, but I also don't want to bore people. Um, so again, first of all, context is really important. And then Tim added this, and I think this is also very important. He has to say libertarianism, not to be confused with the libertarian political party. They are two different things. Uh, libertarianism is a philosophy, a political philosophy. That's different from the libertarian political party. That's his point there. And I think that's a very uh, good distinction that needs to be made. Um, so the, the philosophy of liberty is a philosophy that can bridge party lines, countries, socioeconomic groups, religions, age, gender, and ethnic makeup. In other words, I think to all those different diverse groups, there's something that appeals to them that's part of the freedom philosophy. And there's, in a lot of cases, some that people shy away from or they think doesn't really make a lot of sense to them. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll bring that sense in this show. Um, and, and I think Tim also points out something here that's very important and, and I think usually how it goes. You know, you can start to embrace liberty in small steps or in giant leaps, right? Uh, it depends on every person is different. You do your own thing. But uh, the beauty of liberty is it's in its simplicity and consistency from the grassroots up to a global scale. And I think that's also extremely important, something that when I forwarded this outline to Tim that I neglected, you know, Every other system that I'm aware of is a top-down system, right? Basically, we're going to have this group that's going to tell society how to function or dictate how society functions. And a lot of people see that as a good thing. They see, well, that's how order happens, right? There's some group, groups, whatever, people that make these decisions for other people. Otherwise, Chaos would ensue, you know, if, if you didn't have this common um, dictate from the top, you know, things would be disorderly. Well, I would argue actually the opposite. And again, this requires context. It sounds a little crazy. I, I actually support that the, in the system we have now, the state actually creates disorder. The state is largely the cause of chaos that people see, right? And, and if you eliminated the state, you would not, you would have less conflict amongst people. In other words, you'd have more social order versus what we have now, I would argue, is less. And I know, that, again, that's a giant leap for a lot of people that don't quite get that. But that's not really where I wanted to 
you know, spend the time on the show tonight, but I just wanted to point that out. And then there's another thing before I really get into what uh, the philosophy of freedom is about, is something I alluded to earlier that, you know, basically this is like saying, hey, I want to, <coughs> excuse me, teach theoretical physics in an hour. And, and, I, and I think this is something important, and this is something that Brad struggled with early on, too. You know, when you enter into a description of, of the political philosophy, such as liberty, uh, you know, you, the questioner, or someone who's not, you know, uh, fully in tune with it, you know, really looks at, hey, the onus is on, in this case, me, to fully explain this. Otherwise, how are, how is somebody going to understand what this new system, in air quotes, is, when in fact it's really not a system. But let me give you, I don't know, I think my detractors will see these, these as cop-outs. I see them as realistic. <laughs> but the question comes up is how things will work. And me, in this case being the presenter, I have to make the, uh, ex the explanation of how things will work in order to satisfy someone to do so. I'm actually making the argument that I don't need to do that. That's what I'm saying here before we really get going. And, and why? You know, the political philosophy is in part that the people themselves would work out on out, you know, what to do under their terms and their conditions as, as how to best cooperate rather than appointing another group or groups to do so on their behalf, right? So I understand this is already unsettling. Wait a minute, you're saying the people themselves are gonna work out how to cooperate? You know, there's gonna be lawsuits like crazy. There's always gonna be lawsuits fighting because <clears throat> Things aren't settled. Well, I would argue, in contrast to that, things actually aren't settled right now. Because if they were, there wouldn't be hardly any lawsuits. But we all know that the courts are jammed with everything from Obamacare to disputes between individuals, uh, between corporations, etc. Individuals and corporations, all that stuff, right? So think about it for a second. Things are actually not settled, and I would argue they're less settled given the situation we have now. Um, and the other thing is, the state in this case is the cause of many of the conflicts, right, that are in the courts. So if the state didn't exist, those conflicts would go away. So now we have less conflict, again, would be my uh, view. But <clears throat> here's another thing. How things would work is really not, from my view, not a serious question. And you think, well, wait a minute. How things would work is that not a serious question? Let me give you an analogy, okay? Let's roll back to before uh, emancipation, before the free, uh, slaves were freed in this country in the South, generally, right? What if I asked Trigger and said, hey, you're telling me you think the, the slaves ought to be freed, right? And I, if I put to you the question, well, wait a minute, Trigger. If we free the slaves, how is all the cotton going to get harvested? You might I don't know, you'd have to hire somebody, I don't know, and help uh, increase the productivity by creating this machine to do it, the cotton gin and all this stuff, right? Yes. And I go, well, that machine doesn't exist. What are you talking about? You, you, right? It, yeah. it can't be done. So what would I do? I be Am I making the argument that the slaves should not be freed because I'm not sure or I'm not convinced that how the cotton will be harvested? Right? What I'm yeah. saying is the moral argument, the, the justification of it is what rules here, not how things might work out afterwards. The, the slaves were wrongly enslaved in the first place. And once they were enslaved, they should have been set free immediately, right? Why? On moral and legal grounds, on, on, on grounds of justice. Not because we did or did not know how cotton was going to be harvested. Okay, so that's my analogy for, well, how would things work out, Tom, in a free society? And say, well, the real answer is, not only do I not know, nobody knows because it's unknowable. It's like you're asking me, well... What will our communications device look like in 50 years? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows that will be, the market will shake that out, right? Uh, we'll, we'll have the communicators like Star Trek. But hey, uh, we're pretty be, darn close right now, actually. It'll be a chip, and whatever I'm thinking. Ooh. 
uh, telepathy. He's saying telepathy. So no device. No chips. Just a little tiny chip. Just sign. Yeah, it'll be built in. See, so, so these questions that people are have unsettling and that really bother them, I'm arguing that actually should not bother you. And that doesn't make it not bother you. I realize that. It still bothers you. But you're, you're asking about, I've got this new supercar and it runs on a ounce of sweat. And your question is, well, how am I going to get the sweat? And they'll say, hey, once you put one ounce of sweat in there, it runs for 400 years. You only last for 80 or 100. So what are you worried about if you can get that one ounce of sweat? I think you can. But again, I wouldn't be able to prove that to you, right? So you'd be like, well, I don't know how we're going to be able to transport ourselves, right? You see a bit that it's an absurd question in a way. And that's my point here before we get into this. But with that, I want to keep moving along. Unless you, you got something triggered. No. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. So think about that analogy with the slaves, right? How would cotton get harvested if we freed the slaves? That's really what that type of question is. But I wanted to, okay. I'm going to say, uh, let me try to describe the political philosophy of freedom now. And, and so we're going to get into the meat of the topic a little bit. Um, freedom is simply, it's a political philosophy, right? Um, it recognizes that we live in a world of scarcity. And by the way, even in the Garden of Eden, scarcity exists, right? You only have one body. You can only, only one body can stand in one place, blah, blah, blah. So scarcity is a reality. And because of that, conflicts may arise. Some of this is like from Hans Hermann Hoppe. But, um, so the question now becomes, what mechanism or means should we use to resolve the conflicts that inevitably will arise? How do you... Um, resolve disputes right what do we do well you say hey tom you dummy we're going to create this system that we have today it's called the courts that's how you uh resolve disputes and again i would argue the system that we have more than the courts right the whole state as i call it generically is is the cause of a lot of the disputes so i'm i'm saying that's not a very good system no it's not so on what foundation you know, should we create this new, again, air quote, system? Because there's really no system here. So that's one of the primary questions that we need to address here tonight. Okay, so the, let me go on. The philosophy of freedom concerns itself with the social order. You know, that is, how should society be organized? Should it be done by organizers, right? I don't, whether you where the people are appointed, whether it's a monarchy, where it's by bloodline, whether we have an election, um, however this is done, should a select group of people, I like to call them our rulers, determine the rules of the game for the ruled, right? If you support that basic idea, you, you do definitely support at least two classes of people. The rulers and the rule and the rule, right? You can't say no. I'm everybody's on equal legal standing. Well, actually, they're not, right? If you support that, hey, there has to be some group dictating, telling, uh, coercing, cajoling people on how to behave and what they can and what they cannot do, right? So that's a, another problem of the current system. It's a it's it's a problem that is avoided by uh, the freedom philosophy, where people work it out amongst themselves. Uh, Tanya pointed that out last week, and I think she did a great job of that, that in fact, that is the best way. Um, the other thing is, where does this political philosophy come from? I'm diverging here a little bit, and I think this is important. It's not that some guy or some guys or some gals just sat around one day and said, hey, let's devise a system, right? What I'm trying to uh, explain tonight, or the foundation for it, is actually inherent in nature. And we're going to get to that in a second. But this is, the point is, this is not something made up. This is something revealed by man, not something created by man. But let me get back to the, 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 the political philosophy of freedom concerns itself really with justice. Okay, and then the question is, well, okay, but what is justice? Is it something that we simply define... And then, then, of course, if we gain agreement, and that's in quotes, what does that really mean? Does every single person have to agree to it? Does just a majority of people have to agree to it? Do just a majority of people who voted have to agree to it? Is it something that uh, people who have a certain bloodline can just tell everybody how it's done? Right? There's, 
it seems if when I say that, I'm hoping some people go, well, they actually, that sounds a little unrealistic or kind of crazy. Just because some guy had a certain bloodline means he should dictate how the society is organized. Well, yeah, it happened before. <laughs> Lots of times, right? And just because some guy won a popularity contest or gal, they should be able to determine, you know, what the rules of the game or how yeah. society should be organized. That's not a popularity contest. It's an election. Yeah, I call it a popularity contest, by the way. But, well, I'm just and, and even that, people say, well, it's majority rules. I'm like, okay, wait. When you say majority rules, what do you actually mean by that? Do you mean majority of people who voted? Because if you look recently in the United States, it's certainly not a majority of the people who reside in this country or who maybe you could call them citizens of the United States. It's not a majority of them with a presidential election or with almost any election. Now, I don't know the stats on all the elections, so somebody's going to dig up one election where there actually was a real majority voted for a councilman somewhere, and they'll go, see? <laughs> I'm not saying that ex I would but call those exceptions. That it can't be an exception because it's part of a flawed system. And even if that is the case, yes. And the reason is that it's flawed is because, you know, and this is if you watch some of those uh, videos on YouTube from the Harvard Law School that uh, Trigger announced the episode six of, is the question is, so if it is up to a majority rule, what's up to a majority rule? Is everything up to a majority rule? Like if if we get a majority of people to say that we're going to just all of it, we'll take Tom's clothes from him, we're going to have an election, and if a majority says yes, then we take his clothes? Or are there some limits as to what could be up for a, a proposition? Right? Yeah, just your socks. Just my socks? Not, yeah. All right. There you go. So... That's, you know, one of the things that needs to be thought about. And I think most people don't. I think most of this is, I would argue, and this is hurtful to a lot of people, that you've been indoctrinated. And I know most people, if not everyone, will say, of course I'm not indoctrinated. I know nothing. But think about it. The nature of indoctrination is the fact that you don't recognize it, right? Because <laughs> if you did recognize you were indoctrinated, you would become unindoctrinated. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, so... These are some of the issues that we bring up on this show uh, almost on an every episode basis that people can be offended by. They're not intended to be offended, but it's sometimes to point out the facts or what is actually happening is some people find that, you know, troublesome or offensive or whatever. And I think you got to set that aside for the moment and let uh, me and the show make the moral case for the freedom philosophy. And, and have your little discomforts with how things will work out or how you could even consider abandoning, you know, the system we have now because this is the greatest country on the planet Earth. It's the greatest country that's ever been on the planet Earth, right? Yes. So people say, well, there's a whole lot of risk associated with this. And I would argue there's actually much less risk with, with uh, backing or supporting or advocating for justice rather than accepting injustice uh, for the environmentalists out there that you know, it this is an unsustainable system injustice is unsustainable it eventually will come to an end what day i don't know it's been going on for a while so yes it has been <laughs> and i think our troubles are getting deeper and deeper be, because it's an unsustainable system yes and they don't want it they want it to be sustained yes and and it the 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 people in charge want it to be sustained Thing. And most of the citizenry, I would argue, want it to be sustained. They want, they, I think some of them, they want that comfort of someone telling them what to do. Yes, and, and they see it as stability. Yes. The sameness. Yeah, because if, there, what, if it, they weren't there, there would be no stability, but there would be. Right. There would be greater stability yeah. without them. But sameness is uh, something that a lot of people really have an attraction to. and But... Yeah, understand well, the government taking money from you that man that's, that's pretty protective to me <laughs> hey we want your money exactly but okay when you claim to sameness if it's unsustainable you realize it must come to an end yeah. at some point it's not that i think it will it's not that i i think it might it, there's no choice here it's unsustainable and it must come to an end so that sameness can only be, be uh, maintained for so long and then big changes are going to come and they are likely going to be very uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, 
you know, when we talk about, you know, what is precisely what is justice, I'm going to get into that just a little bit here and, and then the nature of it. The political philosophy of freedom and justice, for that matter, are not simply, you know, essentially contracts. It's they're not an agreement between certain people. What I'm saying is that the concept of justice is inherent in nature. It pre-exists even the man's uh, placement here on this planet. So think about this. Here's my maybe analogous view of it. It's a law of nature, not unlike gravity, in the sense that whether you understand the nature of gravity or not, it still acts on you, right? You can deny that gravity exists. You can claim it doesn't act the way it actually does. And again, we could argue about what it actually does. You can make all those arguments and you can make them as vehemently as you want, but it doesn't change the fact that gravity is acting on you and it acts in its natural way, right? However it acts. So the words really don't matter. What matters is that gravity is acting on you. Okay, I'm making essentially the same case for justice. Um, and there's a number of way, ways, by the way, to essentially make this case. This is just one of them. Uh, I'm, what I'm pointing to here ultimately is going to be called natural law. So it's not created by some group or people writing it down. If, they, if it's written down accurately by someone or a number of people, it's just describing what nature exists. Right. And so if you do it accurately, you're saying, hey, I'm able to describe uh, nature. It's like the uh, uni uh, universal gravitational cons uh, constant, um, that whole, uh, what is it, uh, little g equals big G times m1, m2, all over r squared. Right. Uh, there's a long equation for that. I know. I'm sorry. I just said that because <laughs> a lot of people don't know what that is. But the point is, it's defined mathematically. But that may, in fact, not be a perfect description. I think in large part, we know that it's actually not perfect. But for, in a sense, practical purposes, it works. The point is, that's a description of what already exists. So the words when we talk about here shortly, the non-aggression axiom, private property rights rooted in self-ownership, etc. We're just trying to describe or reveal to you what's inherent in nature. And again, that's fundamentally different from the system that is in place in the United States, like this system of democracy based on the Constitution. I would argue that is some fellas, and in this case it was all fellas, got in a room and they hammered this out. Yes, I know there was ratification, all this other stuff. But essentially, they hammered out and they wrote a document and said, hey, we're going to start a country based on this here agreement right here. That was completely man-made. It wasn't uh, necessarily founded in man's nature of justice. It was just an, essentially an agreement. And it's a crazy agreement because I don't know about you people. I didn't agree to it. Nobody ever brought it to me and said, hey, would you sign this and agree, agree to it? I don't think I know anyone who's actually explicitly consented to the Constitution, wait, unless you're talking about a uh, 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 someone who's holding a political office, I don't know if political office is the right word, right, where they swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States, yeah. right? I've never done that. But most of them are liars, so they're probably, they're not really upholding it. Yeah, and we already know now, um, they don't uphold the Constitution in no. the least. Even uh, was Nancy Pelosi said, "Constitution, we don't, we don't care, we don't worry about the Constitution. That's uh, the Supreme Court has to worry about that, not us." Um, even though you swore an oath to uphold the Constitution, apparently, you don't. okay, <laughs> this is what they call a newfangled word, a world. Um, the newfangled word, if you get from Tanya. <laughs> yes, sorry. So here's the point: we we got we I got talking about uh, the man's nature, right? And that justice is not created by the thoughts of man and no other political philosophy shares similar roots. Okay, so this is where it's fundamentally different in my view. A lot of people will go, no, what's fundamentally different is the roads might be financed differently. I'm like, you know, not really a major consequence in my view. It, they're it's, still there. What's the matter how they're funded? It, it's done differently. Exactly. And, they're still and, there. They're still roads. And they're done in a just way versus an unjust way. I'm saying that's better. Yeah. I like justice. I'm Call me crazy, but I like justice. Um. So anyway, that's where we're going You're here. You're telling me that I want to drive on this road, I have to pay for it. But now, if I don't want to drive on this road, I have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's exactly... I right. like the first one. Right? Yes. I'll pay for I'll pay for what I use. 
<laughs> and what I don't use, I am not really too interested in paying yeah. for. Those ones in the southern half of the state I never drive on, why should I pay for them? Right. Um, and, and you actually, even in a, in a free society, you could pay for them. You just donate the money. Yeah. Just go, hey, I, I think down there in Mississippi, they got to have a road from uh, Kill Mississippi to... I might be going through there one day. Right. So I'll, I'll pay for it. I think probably the way it'll turn out, it'll essentially be, in a, essence, a toll road, and you'll pay when you drive on it. And I don't have any problem with that. But again, no. I, only because I think it's just, not because I happen to like it emotionally. It's only because I think it's just, but we'll get to more of that here in a second. So, but there's one more thing about the freedom philosophy being rooted in nature. And I think this is all very important. And here's the point. It's universal, which means it applies at all times and all places in all circumstances. And that's the problem with having your quote unquote government <laughs> on the basis of, say, a religion. And, and I know a lot of people right now, the, the one to, to really point on is uh, Islam, right? The, what, the ISIS guys, they want to have, what is, what's their, I can't remember the thing that, you know, they want to have a Sharia law, right? And a lot of people disagree, whether they're atheists, they're Christians, I don't know, all the Buddhists, whatever. I, I haven't heard too many Buddhists. I don't hang out with too many Buddhists to my knowledge. Anyway, right, they all object because... Well, that's, you know, Sharia law, which is essentially the Quran Islamic law. And I'm a Christian, so, huh? And I agree with you. There's a problem there. Well, since you don't happen to believe in that system, you're going to have trouble with it, and vice versa, right? If you went over there, where, say, there's a large majority of, <coughs> of people who follow the Quran, and you say, hey, we're going to establish Christian law, I got a feeling they're going to have some trouble with that. Why? Because religion is not a universal ethic, right? But nature is. You tell me where you can be, when you can be, whether it be in the future or in the past, where nature does not work on you, whether you believe it does or not, right? So it's universal. It applies to everyone at all times, all places, all circumstances. It's inescapable. So I think that's an important point, universality. Okay, so so that's a that's something to think of. And I know for those of you who are just joining us or joining us for the first time or so, you're saying, well, wait, is he going to really get to this? Well, again, it's like trying to teach theoretical physics in an hour. i got to preface this as best I can so you have a basic understanding of where we're going here before I dive into it. So let, I'll, I'll get a little more to the nuts and bolts of it at the moment. I'm going to use this term libertarians, which I kind of said I didn't want to do, but I am for this show. They actually do, they're no monolith, just like, uh, you say, Democrats. You know, they don't all support exactly the same thing, right? They, they're, they, there's some variations there. Well, libertarians are the same way. Yeah, we got some interference coming through. I don't know what it is. Anyway, <clears throat> so, um, but they do, by and large, agree on a couple things. And that is, you know, when is the use of force justified? And if so, if there is a point where it is justified, under what circumstances? And the answer is, there is a circumstance where the use of force is justified. And again, this is going back to the laws of nature. And the only circumstance that is known today, doesn't mean someone will discover something in the future, is in self-defense. When I say self-defense, though, I mean that a little more generally. It's in defense of person and property. And we'll get to that exactly what constitutes property in a second. Okay, so the problem is it's the initiation of force or violence that is, in fact, unjust. But think about this. If that were the case, that no one initiated violence against another, well, then no one would have to ever use defensive violence or force. So nobody would be using force. Now, wait a minute, you're saying, oh, okay, you're saying this uh, free society, no one would ever ag aggress or initiate violence against... No, I'm not saying that. What I am really saying is it sh the initi initiation of violence should not be legalized Right? In other words, I'm saying if you did initiate violence against someone, you should be subject, subject to sanction. 
right? In other words, if I drag you in front of it, trigger initiated violence against me, you say, well, how do you know he actually did it? Well, let's say I'm convinced he did. I drag him in front of an impartial third party. Some people call that a court, right? Yeah. And I make my case. Trigger gets his shot at it to say, hey, I wasn't even there, or, or I didn't do what he says he did, and I have proof. Uh, my cousin was watching the whole time, and here's my cousin. He'll tell you. Whatever, you know, the extent of the thing, right? And an impartial third party says, nope, Trigger, you initiated violence against Tom. You took his two chickens. You need to return the two chickens and five extra dollars for his troubles, right? So <clears throat> that's the point. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's not real clear cut. It would have to go to court. Hello, doesn't that happen that at all? Discord. That was Discord right there. Yeah. That third party. Right. But people say right now, well, no, it's clear cut. We don't have to do that. Well, yes, actually, every time you do, in fact, have a dispute, if it persists long enough or escalates enough, it goes to court. So when I say in a free society, these things would have to be worked out in front of an impartial third party, essentially, there's no difference now that in how it it, it is... Uh, perceived by the person who's seeking justice, and that's not entirely true. Give me some license here in a second, because the way courts are funded the and more is very important to a free society, but let me hold that off for a second. So, but you get the point. Uh, the initiation of violence is unjust. Typically, that's called the use of aggressive force. That's unjust. The use of defensive force is justified or justifiable. Okay, that's the difference. You got to know aggressive force, defensive force. Uh, not so good. Good. Okay. Well, so, it's not, the second one's not good, really, because it's. It's, it's good that you have that tool. Yes, but it's not good if you use, use it. it. Yes, you don't want you to. Use it. You only, you know, typically you do it. Ooh, I get to use just the final force. <laughs> yeah. Well, some people get off on that. Yeah, right? they might get off. Anyway, so um, that's the point. Now. Here's the deal. If uh, I'm, I'm going to go a little deeper, if you if you define aggressive force and defensive force, how am I going to know if there's the use of aggressive force? How are we going to figure that out? the The point is you have to assign property rights. I mean, how do I know if Trigger stole my pencil if I don't know I actually own if it was in fact my pencil, right? I would have to somehow be able to establish that the pencil actually legally belonged to me in order to determine that this was a case of essentially theft, right? Yeah. If, if I can't establish that it was my pencil in front of this third party arbitrator, you say, well, there's no theft here if, it, if you can't establish that the pencil belonged to you, Tom, right? So you have to assign property rights. And that's how you can know if something, if, if violence was initiated against you or not. Okay? <coughs> and, and the way that most libertarians, not all by any stretch, there's like five ways that I know, I, I happen to know of, but there's probably more than that of, way, of uh, the way property rights can be established. The libertarians tend to use self-ownership. Okay? So... Inherent in nature, I'm saying, you own yourself. But there's more to it than that, and we're going to go deeper in a couple shows from now about this. But let me just briefly say, if you say, well, you don't accept that Tom says that's inherent in nature, that you own yourself. Um, I, don't, I don't know. All, there's a number of possibilities. Say, wait, let's just, I'm going to go through it very quickly. If you don't own yourself, you have a choice. Maybe somebody else owns you. If somebody else owns me, isn't that the definition of slavery? Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is if somebody else owns me, you would support slavery? All right. If you think about that for a second, I think a lot of people, eh, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable with that position. And it's more than comfort, but I'm just using that as a little argument here quickly. Okay. So if it's not somebody else that owns you, maybe it's all of society or a bunch of people own you. If that's the case, how can I do anything? Because I, I have to have permission, right? Because we have an agreement. I have an agreement with everybody that I'm co-owned. Yeah. Well, that's impossible. The reason is I can't ask permission because I have to have permission to ask permission. Right? Yeah. So my whole point is you're exercising self-ownership 
in arguing against self-ownership. So in, in essence, it's called axiomatic. It's given in nature. But again, we'll go deeper in that later. But all right, So the point is, this goes all the way back to property rights rooted in self-ownership. And it, and it goes to uh, the non-aggression principle, which again says, hey, the use of aggressive force is un not justified. Right? Yep. Subject to sanction if you do it. Oh, geez. And I would just gibby gabby and so long my computer went to sleep. And therefore my notes are gone. Uh, well, I should remind you before I move on, you are in fact listening to the Annoying Peasant Radio Show. And we were going to have... Tim with us tonight, but our technology did a doo doo on us, let's say, and but we still have Trigger with us. Yes. So thanks everyone, thanks everyone for joining us. And we are and... oh what <laughs> what yeah he wants to say something then he okay. backs out. So those are the couple things that most libertarians agree on, right? The non aggression principle yes. and property rights rooted in self ownership. So um, let so here's the thing. So you own yourself. And you can't aggress against anyone. And if you do, yes, of course you can. It's just if you do, you'll be subject to sanction. You might get penalized for it, essentially, right? So how do you come to own property? Well, if you own yourself and you mix your labor with something yet unowned, you, you obtain ownership of, it, ownership of it legitimately, right? Essentially what I'm saying is homesteading. And, and now people get lost and think, well, that's the only way you acquire land. But how do you acquire, I don't know, a hammer? Okay, but hang on. Let's, don't be so trapped in the middle of the thing. But let's use the land for a second, right? right. Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's assume we're going to the moon tomorrow. Trigger and I are going on a road trip to the moon. He thought we were going to Kansas. But they, clicked they did that same story on The Wizard of my, Oz. I was clicking my heels. See? <laughs> okay, but check it out. We go to the moon. As far as we know, it's yet unowned. We decide to lay down. Um, someone might have a little different say. But... I like living on a, on a, on a. If the moon were made of the spare ribs, would you eat it? Uh, yes. We digress. <laughs> so I wash it down. With <laughs> so we go to Trigger and I go to the moon and we yep. establish a mining operation. I don't know. There's something good in there. Mercury. I have no idea what's on the moon. Blue cheese. Right, and we ribs. <laughs> we mine the blue cheese out of the moon, and we're the only ones that no one has been there before us. In our spot, we're doing our thing. We own the blue cheese. Why? Because we mixed our labor. We only own the part of the blue cheese. Yes, the part we the part that we occupy, right. the part that we mine. Right. I, yes. Right. That's the point. That's how you come to homestead and own things that were at, just previously unowned. By mixing your labor. That's one way that you can legitimately own things. So now, we, you own yourself. We established that. All right. And now you own things that were previous, just previously unowned. Blue cheese on the moon. Blue cheese on the moon. Because you mixed your labor with it, right? Yeah. So is that the only way that you can uh, come to own something? The answer is no. There are other ways. They are essentially fall under the category of legitimate title transfers. So let's just say for this, Trigger went to the moon and he is the one who mined the blue cheese. Me, on the other hand, I decided to go to Mars and mine the crackers. And we happen to get wind of each other and say, hey, Trigger, how about I trade you? We'll do a legitimate title transfer of some of your cheese. For some of my crackers. Mars crackers. Right? Sound pretty good. Right? So we arrange how many pounds of cheese for how many crackers. I don't know. The, right. the, uh, boxes of crackers or whatever we do. Right? As long as you're not coerced. In other words, I'm not got a bullet to your head saying, hey, I think you should do the deal for six pounds of cheese for six boxes or I'm going to cap you. A bullet. Though. Right? You're, if it, you're a bullet. A bullet. <laughs> Right, so you're holding a bullet. <laughs> yes, it's a bullet. Well, <laughs> there's very little gravity, so it's hard to get you. Anyway, right? We get right. together and we mutually decide right. to make this trade. Yeah. We essentially what we're doing is uh, transferring the titles to those things, right? So now I get to own uh, six pounds of cheese and he gets six pounds of crackers. And you can see how that might be advantageous if you're sitting on millions of pounds of blue cheese and no crackers. 
that dude might really like some crackers. And conversely, I'm like getting kind of sick of crackers. I like to have some cheese with them, right? Mm -hmm. So this is very important. What I just described is what they call, a, again, it's a legitimate title transfer, but it was a voluntary exchange. We both agreed to it voluntarily. If that happens, we both uh, made out on that deal. In other words, Trigger, Trigger is richer than he was just prior to the exchange, and I'm richer just prior to the exchange. So what I'm telling you is, wait, people are now sitting a little back, wait a minute, you just said the stuff, the same stuff exists, it just got swapped hands, the titles were transferred, and you're telling me both guys are richer, in other words, wealth was created? I'm telling you, yes, that is the case. Why? Because I believed I was better off with uh, six pounds of cheese versus six boxes of crackers. Yes. And, and Trigger, conversely, believed he was going to be better off, right? So, in fact, we are better off. And you're saying, well, no, I don't think you're better off. That's not up to you. It's only up to the people who are involved in the exchange. Because some people might think that the money, um, a monetary, monetary value, would be made me richer. But right. to me, the cheese, or the crackers, or the blue cheese or the crackers, would probably taste pretty good. It's something called marginal utility. Yeah. This is a big economic argument. But... I'll, I'll make it real short. If you had a dozen eggs, they might be worth a lot to you. But if you had 5,000 dozen eggs, that fifth thousand dozen might not be very valuable. It's like, I got 4,990 more. What am I ever going to do with them, right? Yeah. So the marginal utility, and the same with the cheese, the mining of cheese, you're sitting on a mountain of cheese, I'm sitting on a mountain of crackers, blah, blah, blah. Long story, right? So, and there's more to it. I, I can't do with the whole story in two seconds. But here, what I'm saying is that in a voluntary exchange, wealth is, in fact, created. Okay? And I know that's a tough one for people to wrap their heads around, but just set that aside for a second. Well, there's a... So that's one legitimate title transfer, voluntary exchange. And we're going to contrast that with coerced exchange here in a little bit, but I just leave it at that. Another way to legitimately gain the title of something is gambling. Right? I uh, Use the common example. I go to Vegas, I, I don't put my, can I be really lucky? Okay, I'm going to put my quarter in and ding, 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 ding. Six million dollars. It's You're lucky. <laughs> See, that's good, right? But that's a legitimate title transfer. Essentially, the terms were known, whatever the statistics, and a lot of people don't even care to know what the statistics are, right? But I'm willing to risk my quarter for six million dollars. For six million dollars. No matter how terrible the odds are against me, and they're pretty terrible, by the way. Yes. But that is, in fact, still a legitimate title transfer. And again, some people are getting a little tipped into this. you saying it's legit to gamble? Yes. I'm not saying it's moral or immoral. I'm just saying it should it's be legal. Immoral. It's probably most people think it's immoral. But if I'm your game, if you have the casino or the gambling machine and I voluntarily walk up, put a quarter in. We agree to do the exchange. Yeah. We agree. Right? As I long as up, you're not coerced. I looked up and saw my odds of winning were 1 in 300 million. Right. And bing, bing, bing. You win. Um, okay, so gambling is another. Another way to legitimately obtain um, title to something is a gift. You could just give me stuff if you want to. By the way, I'm open for every one of our listeners to just give me stuff. I mean, good stuff. All right. Like, I am too. Good. Like, I'm open to accepting cash. In unmarked bills. <laughs> okay? So well, one of the things that fall under gifts, you know, obviously would be inheritance. That's a legitimate title transfer is what I'm saying. Okay? Uh, in a free society. Now I know in, in this society, essentially uh, inheritance is a legitimate title transfer with, of course, a caveat that the federalities take. Inheritance tax. <laughs> yeah, they take their percentage off the top. But let's set that aside for the moment. What I'm just saying is a gift or inheritance is not is a legitimate title transfer in a free society. It's consistent with the freedom philosophy. Okay, so now we've established essentially what the, the non-aggression principle that uh, aggressive force bad, defensive force good, not a good description, um, uh, property rights rooted in self-ownership and how you come to own stuff, right? We, we've gone that far. Okay, but it, this is more than you think, okay, so what? We know that we can own stuff, big deal. I already know I can own stuff now. Well, actually, I think in the, this society, you think you own stuff, but you actually don't. But again, we'll set that aside for a second. 
This does more for you than that. If you come to accept the non-aggression principle and you accept property rights rooted in self-ownership, it becomes essentially a guidepost for you on every issue of what should be legal and what shouldn't be legal, right? If you can say that, let's say I accept the freedom philosophy and you say to me, um, wait a minute, Tom, should prostitution, you know, it's kind of a bad thing. I don't think it should be legal. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think, I don't think guys nor gals, giving the typical case, um, either one of them really benefit. I don't think they do. So I think it should just be illegal. Right. And, and what I'm saying is if Trigger were saying that to me, he'd be making a moral case. Okay. And he, he can make his moral case. I can't tell him what's moral or immoral just as he really can't tell me what's moral or immoral. That's only for me to decide. Now, we can decide what's ethical, because that's kind of a universal thing. Morals are a personal thing. But again, we'll back away from that. Here's how I would analyze that now. Given what I just understood from, from the discussion we had is, well, wait a minute. Does prostitution violate the non-aggression axiom? No. Right? Is is one party or the other aggressing against the other? If if they agree to an uh, 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 engage in a sex act for cash, right? exchange goods. Right? If they uh, voluntarily agree, there's no coercion again. No. Right? If they if they do so, if they agree to do it, so is anybody's property rights being violated? No, they're not. All right. No property rights, and there's no aggress use of aggressive force. That's now become how I analyze that. So what I'm saying is this is not just a foundational argument for, oh, this is how a definition or how a free society would be set up. I'm saying it's also an analysis tool. Uh, should there be Obamacare, right? Should there be these things? We'll look at it. Are people's property rights being violated? Are they being aggressed against, right? And so it becomes a guide tool. Um, you know, so we go to, and then the, the question becomes, you know, this is how order is actually brought to the world because you have this analysis tool, right? And I think that's a, that's an interesting thing. And here's here's one more caveat, I think, before I want to get to Jacob Hubert. Um, you know, you either hold to these bedrock tenets, right? You stick to them at all times, at all places, because they're universal, right? We've already essentially established that if you can follow the discussion. What about exceptions? People say, well, there has to be certain exceptions. How are we going to feed the poor, feed the hungry who can't afford to do that? And I don't want to get too sidetracked into that at the moment. The answer is, of course, there's other ways of doing it. But those are exceptions creates a continuum problem. In other words, let's just say for the moment, I agree to you. You know what? I agree with you. Sorry. There should be an exception here that we should create a state to tax people to take a, a, a certain amount of money from each individual. And we're going to put that in a pot and we're going to feed the hungry. Okay. Let's just say we agree to that. And let's just say everybody agrees to it. Except for one guy. Let's just make one guy be the oddball that says, no, nah, I don't think it's right. But we impose that on them. Right? We take it. So now, what have we done? The idea of helping people out of your own volition, out of, based in your own morality, you think, hey, I think I'm going to try to help this person. I'm either going to give them money or going to donate food. That's a virtuous act. What have we just done to that one guy who says, I don't consent to this? We started with taking his money to him, from him and say it still goes to feeding the poor. Let's say it actually goes to where we claim it's going to go. Yes. What we have done is we made a formerly virtuous act unvirtuous. Why? Because we started with theft. And it was only one person. Though. Right. Even on just one person. So not only do you have that problem, you have the problem of the next guy proposes, you know what? We should actually have a common defense, but everybody should be forced to pay for part of it. And he goes, you know, that's actually kind of a good idea. I like the idea of everybody pitching in because it's for the common defense, right? It sounds good. Okay, here's my point. How many exceptions, right? It's a continuum problem. Now you've started down this slippery slope. Where could you possibly stop? But by the way, even on the first one, 
you violated the tenants. So now you, you can't say, well, you can never say, I think, down the road, say, well, wait, what about the non-aggression axiom? It's like, well, wait a minute, you just, you're okay with violating it for six times. Why can't I violate it at the seventh time, right? So you, you create a whole lot of problems when you start creating exceptions. And, and so that's very, not only very dangerous, you either support these things in my view or you don't, right? You can't say, you can't not support them and say you do. I mean, you can, of course, but you're contradicting yourself. Okay, and that's what we're trying to do is present a, the only coherent philosophy, the only consistent philosophy, no other philosophy known at least to me, for certain, I think that a lot of people would vouch for this, there is no other consistent philosophy. So if consistency matters, if you want to say, hey, we shouldn't steal from people, but I think we should steal from these eight people because I just think we should. If you're okay with that, well, then this might be harder for you. But I think most people say, no, huh, I really don't want to cross that bridge. I don't think it's right to aggress against people, not even if I kind of think it's for the greater good, or it might be a, a good idea for the time being at least, right? You have to go back. Are you comfortable with that? And again, the question is really not comfort or discomfort. It's do you support these two items, the non-aggression axiom and the property rights, or do you not, right? That's the basic question. So let me lighten the mood, as it will were, a little bit, and talk about uh, Jacob Hubert. He is a former show guest, uh, an attorney, a constitutional attorney, I believe, a brilliant guy, a very nice guy, a, a great person to interview, by the way, if you ever have the opportunity to do so. He wrote a book entitled Libertarianism Today. And again, on a little bit of a lighter note, let me just explain to you or read to you what he had to say. He says the basic libertarian idea is that people should be free to do what? Anything that's peaceful. That's maybe a simpler way to say it. And that, that was, as libertarian thinker Leonard Reed put it. And I've, uh, uh, I haven't actually read much of Leonard Reed, but I've watched YouTubes from brilliant guy. He had a great demeanor. Anyway, so again, anything that's peaceful, he says, and uh, Hubert goes on to say, that means in the words of libertarian theorist and ec economist Murray Rothbard that, quote, no man or group of men may aggress against a property uh, excuse me, person or property of anyone else. Or to rephrase it one more time, anyone should be free to do anything he or she wants as long as he or she does not commit acts of force or fraud against any other peaceful person. Libertarians call this the non-aggression principle. Okay, so I, I went through that. Just hopefully it sheds a little more light on what the non-aggression principle is. But here's the thing, he, he says some other things in his book, and then he comes back to this, and, and this I think is important. And this is where a lot of people get lost. I think a fair amount could stay with me and say, yeah, I think it's not right to aggress against individuals, and I think everybody does own themselves in there, or I could be convinced of that. That seems to make sense. But here's where most people catch the hiccup. Uh, Hubert goes on to say, libertarians extend this rule to the political realm. If one person cannot steal money from another, then the government, which is made up of only of individual people, should not be allowed to forcibly take money from people, even if it is called taxation. If one person cannot kidnap another person and force him into slavery, the government should not be allowed to do it either, even if it is called a draft or conscription or national service. If one person cannot go into his neighbor's house and force him to give up bad personal habits, then the government should not be allowed to do it, even if it is called a war on drugs, right? And there's many more examples, he says, and so on. But think about it. If you think these things apply to individuals, these rules, these basic rules, and again, sometimes this falls under the category of anarchism, and people freak out and say, well, no rules. No, that's not specifically not what we're saying here. There are rules, right? Inherent. Yes, but you're self-governing. There is no group or guys or appointees or however you want to describe them. There are no rulers over the rule. You're self-ruling, right? And that's a fundamental difference. It's not that there's no rules. It's you're self-ruling. Um, 
Okay, so l let me move on after Jacob Hubert to talk a little bit about Walter Block. And I think I'm just going to end after Walter Block for this evening. I'm going to do a couple of quotes and then we'll wrap the show up because I really would love to have Tim with me on this and we'll get the technology right and, and we'll go from there. Um, but Walt, Dr. Walter Block, again, another one of my favorites, uh, he wrote a book. I, I know that Tanya just recently finished reading Defending the Undefendable. She wanted to do a whole show on that one, too, by the way. He makes a lot of points that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of people are uncomfortable with. But if you read what he has to say and go through the logic, you're, you're put back in the position of, huh, I guess that should be legal. I don't like it. And that's fine. Just because it's legal doesn't mean you have to engage in that behavior, right? If prostitution is legal, doesn't mean you are forced to go see a prostitute. Right. And I would argue the best way if you say, yeah, but I think other people shouldn't go see a prostitute either. That's great. You could think that. And you know what? If you really have a, a, a great argument or a moral argument, I think what you should do is try to educate people and persuade them. Because if you've done that by making it illegal, you've actually changed people's behavior. I'm not arguing that. Right. If there were some guys that would go to, again, I'm just talking about the conventional way or the traditional way this was done, right? A guy was going to go, he said, oh, geez, I get caught by uh, the police, and then I got to go to court, and it's embarrassing because, of course, public record, everybody knows. I, I, I'm just not going to do it. Okay, so you, in fact, can deter that behavior. You can change a behavior, but you can't persuade the mind that way. So what we're trying to do on this show is educate and persuade, which is a much taller order. But also, if you're able to do so, it's a much more permanent thing, right? And it's, it, it actually leads to a better society, of course, versus just being forced to engage in some activity or to not engage in that activity. Right? Yeah. So, anyway, uh, Walter Block, he uh, comes from the view, I believe this is my view, uh, my uh, uh, perception of where he is is he comes from basically natural law natural life rights what we just kind of went through prior to this that's why I have Walter Block here right and I'll just use his words uh, this is actually I got this off on YouTube if I remember correctly he says the uh, you know li what's libertarianism it's the view that we should keep our mitts to ourselves the non-aggression principle right that's pretty simple and you, and you think about this people at very early age, you understand property rights. You go to kindergarten and you go to grab a block that's in the hand of a kid and the kid like tightens his grip on it and kind of rips it away from you so you can't get it. And he says, mine. Wait a minute. You do it like, hey, you understand uh, property rights rooted in self-ownership? That's it right there. <laughs> okay, he might not be able to express it to you in words. Likely he wouldn't be able to. He's but he does, old. Yeah, he, he, he yes, he inherently understands, right? He knows when he's being aggressed against. So again, I'm just pointing to that this is inherent in nature. This is not something that's just made up. That, oh, I think this is a good idea and we should do it. I'm saying every other way that's made up is going to lead to problems. It has to because it's not in concert with nature. Not in concert with man's nature. There's the problem with that, okay? So, um... So one, he says, we should keep our mitts up to ourselves, the non-aggression axiom, right? Two, he says, hey, a libertarianism is, is a political philosophy, an attempt to explain or to justify the use of violence. Or essentially, he just says, hey, it's a theory of justice, okay? That's kind of alluding to some of the stuff we already talked about. And he says, uh, obviously, a whole ton of other things. But I just want to go through a couple things, and then we're going to call it a day. Um, he says there's three types of libertarians, so people aren't confused here. There are those he broadly, and of course there's more than three, but he, he uses three broad categories. He says there's the anarcho-capitalist, which essentially say there's no exceptions to the use of aggressive force. It, it should never be legalized. Anytime you use aggressive force, you should be subject to sanction. That's the anarcho-capitalist, basically. Then you have the minarchist. They, they support that the government actually does have a legitimate job, and that's broadly to protect property rights, okay? And that's why they establish courts, army, police, 
right? So minarchists generally say, okay, no, there is an exception for the state because the state has to supply these essential, I'm using air quotes, uh, yeah. services. Okay, so they've actually said, no, you can aggress against people, right? But only in these specific exceptions. And I think you, again, you have a continuum problem here. You got a whole lot of other problems, but that's just one of them. Okay, a continuum problem. Then you have the third class, which I don't know, loosely, I think he called it the, the classical liberals. It's a long story. Uh, he put Milton Friedman in there. Uh, that fellows that are kind of... Uh, support the state maybe i don't know if you can even call it minarchist i don't think he does you know they even support the welfare state okay and one thing i wanted to point out if you support the state whether a minimal state or a larger state that you still say is confined to whatever however you want to describe more than just property uh protection right if you support the welfare state also Here's another one of the problems you have, and this is from one of my favorites, Hans Hermann Hoppe. And think about this for a second. This is kind of hard. He says, an expropriating property protector is a contradiction. In other words, if you create the state, they have the authority to tax. And what is that? I would argue that, yes, it's, they just legalized it. It's still theft, but it's legalized theft, right? But wait a minute. If the job of this entity you created, the primary job is to protect property, but they're stealing, they have the ability to steal, they call it expropriating, taking from you, yeah. it's a contradiction. How are they possibly going to protect your property when they're stealing your property? Right? Why protect property if you're allowing someone to steal? And allowing is not the right word because, again, everyone in the... I don't know, just say a given geographic area might not consent to this. You say, well, it's not stealing if I consent. Okay, if, if it is by consent. But if you want to consent and I don't, let you pay. Even if it is consent, why would it have to be backed up with, well, if you don't pay, I got to uh, throw you in a cage. Or I'm going to take even more of your property, right? I'm going to confiscate your entire estate or whatever, right? Well, if it's if it's by consent, why would, why would that be part of the agreement. You wouldn't need it, just by consent, I'll give it to you. Right, so what I'm saying is even the people who think they consent to it, they actually don't no. consent. But again, that's where we could get off of the Lysander Spooner and that's just, that's where we're, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of good stuff in we're, there. We were talking about the, before about the, the prostitution and stuff, that's where he goes on that. Vices are not crimes. Uh, vices are not crimes. Okay. Read that if yeah. you want something good. Yes. So the whole point is an expropriating property protector is a contradiction. So again, you're either supporting something that's coherent and consistent or you're not, in my view. That's just my view. Um, that's, that's not really a judgment there other than just my view, okay? So... He also, again, Walter Block, supports the theory of property rights rooted in self-ownership. Again, basically back to natural law, right? Um, and again, he, he uses the term, you know, homesteading, which is, again, essentially mixing your labor with unowned goods. And by the way, the, the term mixing his, mixes his labor with was originated by John Locke. And some of you go, well, who cares? I don't even know who he is. Well, uh, here's something you may recall. He's the one who originally wrote life, liber liberty, and property, which Jefferson changed in the declaration to the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so you, you actually are familiar with some of his words, some of his work. I'm just trying to point that out. Um, and by the way, I would argue that the Declaration of Independence is a distinctly libertarian document. Not the Constitution so much, but the Declaration of Independence. I'm on there. Again, he talks about legitimate title transfer. We talked about that already. Voluntary exchange, trade, gifts, gambling, inheritance, etc. Right? But, you know, given that there is a state, right, he, he goes on to just describe a couple things. He says, how should the state, given if it exists, what sh how should it uh, behave, right? And he says, on foreign policy non-invasion right so essentially you should have you, you if you're going to have a military right because the minarchist says you got to protect property rights and you have to do it in a monopolistic way that's what they're really saying it's a long story 
Well, you your force could only be used for defensive purposes, not invasive purposes, right? So non-invasion is should be the foreign policy of a state if it wants to behave somewhat uh, in concert with libertarian philosophy, right? In uh, so that's foreign policy. In economics, the only system you could really have there is the free market. Why? Because that's the only economic system that's compatible with the non-aggression axiom, right? Um, again, if I'm the only other type of exchange rather than a voluntary exchange is a coerced exchange, which is basically the highway robber. I walk up to trigger and put the gun to him and say, hey, your money or your life. Right? That's a coerced exchange. Why? Because if he doesn't hand me his money, he believes something worse is even going to happen to him. In other words, he's not going to gain from this. He's like, he, either I lose my money or I lose my life. It's a lose-lose for me. In other words, would he engage in that exchange had I not put the gun to his head? The, the answer is likely not. Right? He may have just said, hey, Tom, I see you on the street here. Here's, here's all my money. Right? It, he could do it. Yes. Okay, but I'm just saying the likelihood of that happening is much reduced. Okay, so he's saying, uh, again, as an economic system, the free market is the only one to support because it's the only system compatible with the non-aggression axiom. And by the way, he also goes on to say, it happens to work very well, right? If you look at countries in his, throughout history, the ones who have uh, allowed... The free market to flourish usually live by a higher standard of living than those that don't okay so not only is it compatible with the non-aggression axiom and consistent with property rights rooted in self-ownership right all the stuff we talked about it also happens to work better than any other system that we know of for economic system right so that's a bonus right it even works well and there's reasons why i'm just not going to explain them all here tonight Again, he says it tends to make societies very wealthy. And again, the only other the alternative is to have coerced exchange or coerced non-exchanges. In other words, I'm going to use the police force to stop Trigger from buying what I'm going to call today illegal drugs. Right? An exchange that he wants to make, but I'm going to forcibly stop him. So it coercion is the problem. It's really not coerced exchange. It could be coer coercively stopping an exchange. Either way, that is destructive. Why? Because Trigger believes if he if he purchased these drugs, he'd be better off. That's why he would voluntarily do it. But I'm going to stop it. So what am I doing? I'm destroying wealth, or I'm not allowing it to be created. Yeah. So coerced exchange is a bad thing for a whole number of reasons, right? Um, and the last one is where I guess I already got to is personal liberties. And again, uh, read. Uh, Walter Block's Defending the Undefendable. There's a whole bunch of different cases in there. But again, you know, and this is where maybe the younger crowd tends to like the libertarians because the libertarians are, well, of course, drugs have to be drugs that we commonly call drugs, not illegal drugs. They need to be legalized, right? Um, and not because we think they're good for people. And in fact, I think you, if you uh, poll the vast majority of libertarians, they would say it's probably not good for you. But that doesn't mean that they therefore support that it make it the use of force to stop someone from doing that. That's even worse, is the point. The way to get people to not engage in these activities is education and persuasion. Okay, and uh, what, I, what I want to say, uh, again, we talked about prostitution. An interesting one, blackmail. Again, you'd have to read Walter Block's book to really get the full story, but blackmail should be legalized. I mean, you so said, we blackmail, I never really thought about that one, right? Well, what is blackmail the idea? I come to, you know, we did this on the show, I did this with Brad a while ago. I come to know that, say, Trigger likes to take a bath with rubber duckies, see? And he doesn't want this information to get out. I go to Trigger and say, hey, here's the deal. I know that you take baths with rubber duckies, and I know you don't want people to know that. Here's the deal. If you're willing to hand me $10, I will enter an agreement with you for the $10 to not say it to anybody. Whose property rights are being violated in such a proposal and an actual exchange? And who's being aggressed against? No one. Exactly. So it leads you to crazy places, is my point. You're just throwing out uh, a deal. Here, here's a deal. Right. You want me to tell everybody, or you don't? Right. And, and I have a choice to make. Do I want everybody to know, or I don't? Right. And now, and if it's worth $10 for me to give it to you, for to not have everybody know that 
I take baths with rubber ducky. See, he just admitted it. <laughs> right? Okay, and here's the deal. If this were actually above board, you you wouldn't be so dumb. You'd have a contract with me. Like, hey, I'm giving you the 10 bucks, but mum's the word, right? Now, let's say two years from now, the word comes out, and you know I'm the only one who knew. You again, take me in front of an impartial third party and say, hey, here's the deal. Here's the contract we had. No talkie. Ten bucks for Tom, but he did do the talking, right? So now you have recourse against me. In the society we have today, this is all done below board. And what recourse do you have? You actually wind up hiring a hit mob to go kill me, right? In other words, it creates a whole lot more problems and, and, and poor incentives, right? Um, all these other problems are created by the system that we have today that people don't recognize actually are created. Um, so with that, I just want to end, again, read Walter Block. He has so many interesting things for you to talk about. I'm going to leave it off where I'm going to go to Lysander Spooner, but we're going to do that next time, and I don't know when that's actually going to be. But I hope... I'm going to be here. Uh, yeah, because I know you're a big Lysander Spooner fan. Yes. He was a crazy dude and a really smart dude. Yes. Um, and we're going to talk about Hoppe, Rothbard, and a few, but I want to get to just a couple quotes just to end on a little lighter note. I know what we went through is kind of heavy duty, and if you really get into it, you got to think about it. But here we go. I just want to read just, just uh, two quotes here to lighten things up a little bit. One quote was, and I don't remember where I even got this, I am self-governing. I don't need a middleman between myself and my freedom. Think about that. I mean, what's so horrible about that? It seems to me to make sense. Cut out the middleman. Right? Like it. Right? Most people do that. Um, and then the, the other one that I think a lot of people who fall in the camp of supporting the state, and I, I would argue don't have a strong philosophical foundation for their viewpoints, but they just want the system to be maintained because it's a good one, quote unquote. And I can make a whole giant case against that. Um, but Here's one for you. Every man and every body of men on earth possesses the right of self-government. Take a gander who said that. I know you, you're totally blindsided. So. Some historical figure in the U.S. Let me read it to you again. So you... Every man and every body of men on earth possesses the right of self-government. Uh, I'm going to see George Washington. Very close. Very good guess. Thomas Jefferson. Right? So people think some of these ideas that we're talking about here are so radical and out of, you know, at the extreme fringe. Well, I could quote some guys who wrote the Declaration of Independence, or part of it, right? And, and were involved in the Constitution of the United States. There's a fellow saying something that I would argue is completely consistent with what we talked about tonight. Yet, when, when this show and, and what we say in the show is viewed by most people, it's too radical, it'll never happen, it's just fringe, it's kind of crazy. What I'm saying is, in summary of this whole thing, we'll do a better job summarizing on the next show for the whole thing, but what I'm saying here is, actually what is supported today is crazy. People support today the systematic uh, theft for millions of people, right? But wait, there's way more than that. That's just that's a little thing. And I know that's basically through the Federal Reserve where we print money, tax the IRS where we confiscate wealth from people, through borrowing is how the government survives, and you still have to pay that back later, right? All these schemes that are essentially wealth robbers from people, right? There's way more to it. What about the uh, aggressive wars? You say, well, you know, some things need to be done. All right, uh, I pointed out before, Madeleine Albright is probably my favorite target here, you know, the, on this show, just because it's so good. She was asked, and I can't remember the number, it was a big number, 50,000, 100,000 or more children were killed in Iraq during the whole dual invasion of Iraq, however you want to describe it, right? And the question posed to her, was it worth it? And she said, yes, of course. Okay? But here, and go on YouTube. You can go on YouTube right now and you can find it. Google uh, Madeline Albright, uh, Iraq War, I don't know. Just Google a few times. You'll find it. 
It's on YouTube. I'm not making this stuff up, right? And, and again, it's not that I have a war against Madeleine Albright. She wouldn't be one of my favorites. I'm not arguing that. But what I'm saying is, it's, she says it was worth it. What do you think? Was it worth it to the guy who lived, and maybe still lives in Iraq, and he lost his baby daughter to the, in the war? Was it worth it to him? Probably not. Right? It's craziness what is going on that innocent people are being killed. Just think of, I mean, it's a smaller scale, but <clears throat> the drone strikes. We sit over here and we go, eh, you know what, it needs to be done, or those people are crazy, they're they're brown people. We don't have a problem getting rid of brown people, right? They're crazy because they don't, they, they're, they're protecting their land. Yes, right? Think about it. And again, they say, oh, wait a minute, you don't understand what happened on 9-11. No, actually, I do, under, I believe I do understand. Now, no, again, that's no, just that's my, my point. The people who were directly responsible for what happened on 9-11 should be prosecuted. Why? Because they violated the property rights of a whole lot of people. Yep. Right? Those were property rights violations. Those people should be prosecuted. Right? I don't have a problem with that. But I'm saying there's a little girl who happens to be next to some, I don't know, uh, jihadist, some ISIS guy. Um, the problem is she gets wiped out. And we just go, eh, collateral damage. Right? You can't even, you know, the government can't even say that, yeah, we we're killed getting, we're, It's for democracy. <laughs> yeah, it's to preserve our way of life. Well, just think what happened in the Soviet story, right? That yeah. documentary that, what was it, 10 million more or more people were killed by Stalin. Well, of course, the survivors are a little better off, right? Because we have to share the wealth amongst 10 million less people. That made me a little worse. So you go, that was a good thing? Well, I could ask the dead people if it was a good thing. If the people killed by Stalin think, well, yeah, it was a good thing, right? It's craziness. The viewpoint that people have, you really need to stop and think about what's happening today and what I've talked about earlier in this show, right? Are the things happening today consistent with those principles that I laid out or are they not? And if they're not, I'm hoping you're, if you recognize that they're not, I'm convinced they're not. But if you recognize they're not, I hope you're a little, at least a little uncomfortable with what's going on. And that inspires you to think about what we've said and and maybe inspires you to look at some of these YouTube videos uh, on there. Walter Block has got a ton of them. He's much more articulate than I am. You can uh, research some of this on your own. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave us for tonight. We have much more to cover, but I think we did certainly made a, a, a strong beginning here. So let me close with, again, you've been listening to the Annoying Peasant Radio Show. We are doing a kind of a, I guess it's turning out now, a small mini-series on what is libertarianism or what is the freedom philosophy. Uh, we always, at the end of every show, we uh, ask you to um, tell your friends about our show or, heck, even tell your enemies. We don't care. We just want more listeners at this point. Um, and the next episode that we're going to do for sure will be on uh, Thursday, March the 26th at the regular time, 7 p.m. That'll be with the Northwoods Mama. We're going to do the education show there. Um, and the show thereafter on a regular Tuesday thereafter will be the one centered on the concept of self-ownership only. We're going to go into greater detail on that. Um, and I may do a short show next Tuesday, not entirely sure. It depends on the travel schedule. So we hope we uh, provoked you to think. Are you coming back from the moon next Tuesday? No, I'm on the Mars. I'm on Mars. Mars. You're on the moon. Get it straight, man. Um, so we hope we provoked you to think a little bit about this. You know, our Facebook page is there, uh, facebook.com slash annoying peasant radio. Make your comments there. You know, we thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll tune in uh, next time with us. And with that, we're going to leave you with a little more Mac DeMarco. And this one is Salad salad Day. Sorry, we started with Passing Out Pieces. So if I've got this right, we'll see. Here we go. Good night, everybody, and thanks for listening to the Annoying Peasant Radio Show. Oh, dear. I'm too late to try another
Thank you.